I will tell you in five lectures the chemical history of a candle. There is not a law under which any part of the universe is governed which does not come into play and is touched upon in the chemistry of a candle. There is no better, there is no more open door by which you can enter into the study of science than by considering the physical phenomena of a candle. I trust, therefore, I shall not disappoint you in choosing this for my subject rather than any newer topic which could not be better were it even so good. So, now as to the light of the candle. Notice that when the flame runs down the wick to the wax, it gets extinguished, but it goes on burning in the part above. Now, I have no doubt you will ask, how is it that the wax, which will not burn of itself, gets up to the top of the wick where it will burn? We shall presently examine that, but there is a much more wonderful thing about the burning of a candle than this. You have here a solid substance, the fuel, with no vessel to contain it, and how is it that this can get up to the place where the flame is? How is it that this solid gets there, it not being a fluid? Or when it's made of fluid, then how is it that it keeps together? This is a wonderful thing about a candle. You see that a beautiful cup is formed. As the air comes to the candle, it moves upwards by the force of current which the heat of the candle produces. And it so cools all the sides of the wax as to keep the edge much cooler than the part within. The part within melts by the flame that runs down the wick as far as it can go before it's extinguished, but the part on the outside does not melt. The same force of gravity which holds worlds together holds this fluid in a horizontal position, and if the cup be not horizontal, of course the fluid will run away in guttering. You see, therefore, that the cup is formed by this beautifully, regularly ascending current of air playing upon all sides, which keeps the exterior of the candle cool. No fuel would serve for a candle which has not the property of giving this cup. These beautiful candles, which are irregular and intermittent in their shape, cannot have that nicely formed edge to the cup, which is the great beauty in a candle. I hope you will now see that the perfection of a process, that is its utility, is the better point of beauty about it. It is not the best looking thing, but the best acting thing, which is the most advantageous to us. These good looking candles are bad burning ones. There is guttering because of the irregularity of the stream of air and the badness of the cup which is formed thereby. You may see some pretty examples, and I trust you will notice these instances of the action of the ascending current when you have a little gutter running down the side of a candle, making it thicker there than it is elsewhere. As the candle goes on burning, that keeps its place and forms a little pillar sticking up by the side because as it rises above the rest of the fuel or wax, the air gets better around it and it is more cooled and better able to resist the action of the heat at a little distance. Now, the great mistakes and faults with regard to candles, as in many other things, often brings with them instruction which we should not receive if they had not occurred. We come here to be scientists, and I hope you will always remember that whenever a result happens, especially if it be new, you should say, what is the cause? Why does it occur? And you will in the course of time find out the reason. Then there is another point about these candles which will answer a question, that is, as to the way in which the fluid gets out of the cup, up the wick, and into the place of combustion. You see that the flames on these burning wicks do not run down to the wax and melt it all away, but keep to their own right place. They are fenced off from the fluid below and do not encroach on the cup at the sides. I cannot imagine a more beautiful example than the condition of adjustment under which a candle makes one part subserve to the other to the very end of its action. A combustible thing like that, burning away gradually, never being intruded upon by the flame, is a very beautiful sight. Especially when you come to learn what a vigorous thing flame is, what power it has of destroying the wax itself when it gets hold of it, and of disturbing its proper form if it comes only too near. But how does the flame get a hold of the fuel? Capillary action conveys the fuel to the part where combustion goes on, and it is deposited there not in a careless way, but very beautifully in the very midst of the center of action which takes place around it. Now, I'm going to give you two instances of capillary action. It is that kind of action or attraction which makes two things that do not dissolve in each other still hold together. When you wash your hands, you take a towel to wipe off the water, and it is by that kind of wetting or that kind of attraction which makes the towel become wet with water that the wick is made wet with the wax. If you throw the towel over the side of the basin, before long it will draw the water out of the basin like the wick draws the wax out of the candle. Let me show you another application of the same principle. You see this hollow glass tube filled with table salt. I'll fill the dish with some alcohol colored with red food coloring.
You see the fluid rising through the salt. There being no pores in the glass, the fluid cannot go in that direction, but must pass through its length. Already the fluid is at the top of the tube. Now I can light it and make it serve as a candle. The fluid has risen by the capillary action of the salt, just as it does through the wick in the candle. Now, the only reason why the candle does not burn all down the sides of the wick is that the melted wax extinguishes the flame. You know that a candle, if turned upside down so as to allow the fuel to run upon the wick, will be put out. The reason is that the flame has not had time to make the fuel hot enough to burn as it does above, where it is carried in small quantities into the wick and has all the effect of the heat exercised upon it. There's another condition which you must learn as regards the candle, without which you would not be able fully to understand the science of it, and that is the vaporous condition of the fuel. In order that you may understand that, let me show you a very pretty experiment. If you blow a candle out carefully, you'll see the vapor rise from it. You have, I know, often smelt the vapor of a blown out candle, and a very bad smell it is. But if you blow it out lightly, you'll be able to see pretty well the vapor into which this solid matter is transformed. When I hold a lighted match two or three inches from the wick, you can observe a train of fire going through the air till it reaches the candle. I'm obliged to be quick and ready, because if I allow the vapor time to cool, it becomes condensed into a liquid or solid, or the stream of combustible matter gets disturbed. Now, to the shape or form of the flame. It concerns us much to know about the condition which the matter of the candle finally assumes at the top of the wick, where you have such beauty and brightness as nothing but combustion or flame can produce. You have the glittering beauty of gold and silver, and the still higher luster of jewels like the ruby and diamond. But none of these rival the brilliancy and beauty of flame. What diamond can shine like flame? It owes its luster at nighttime to the very flame shining upon it. The flame shines in darkness, but the light which the diamond has is as nothing until the flame shine upon it when it is brilliant again. The candle alone shines by itself and for itself and for those who have arranged the materials. The flame is a bright oblong, brighter at the top than toward the bottom, with the wick in the middle. And besides the wick in the middle, certain darker parts toward the bottom where the ignition is not so perfect as in the part above. Now, let me show you. There's a matter rising about it which you do not see. You can actually see streaming round the flame something which is not part of the flame, but is ascending and drawing the flame upwards. There is a current formed which draws the flame out, for the flame which you see is really drawn out by the current and drawn upward to a great height. How remarkable it is that the thing which is light enough to produce shadows of other objects can be made to throw its own shadow. You observe the shadow of the candle and of the wick. Then there is a darkish part, and then a part which is more distinct. Curiously enough, however, what we see in the shadow as the darkest part of the flame is, in reality, the brightest part. And here you see streaming upward the ascending current of hot air, which draws out the flame, supplies it with air, and cools the sides of the cup of melted fuel. You know the flame goes up or down according to the current. You see, then, that we have the power in this way of varying the flame in different directions. Many of the flames you see here vary in their shape by the currents of air blowing around them in different directions. But we can, if we like, make flames so that they look like fixtures, and we can photograph them. Indeed, we have to photograph them so that they become fixed to us if we wish to find out everything concerning them. If I take a flame sufficiently large, it does not keep that homogeneous, that uniform condition of shape, but it breaks out with a power of life which is quite wonderful. In what way does it differ from an ordinary candle? It differs very much in one respect. We have a vivacity and power about it, a beauty and a life entirely different from the light presented by a candle. You see those fine tongues of flame rising up. You have the same general disposition of the mass of the flame from below upwards, but in addition to that, you have this remarkable breaking out into tongues which you do not perceive in the case of a candle. Now, why is this? You have the air creeping in over the edge of the dish forming these tongues. Why? Because through the force of the current and the irregularity of the action of the flame, it cannot flow in one uniform stream. 
The air flows in so irregularly that you have what would otherwise be a single image broken up into a variety of forms, and each of these little tongues has an independent existence of its own. Indeed, I might say you have here a multitude of independent candles. You must not imagine, because you see these tongues all at once, that the flame is of this particular shape. A flame of that shape is never so at any one time. Never is a body of flame like that which you just saw rising from the ball of the shape it appears to you. It consists of a multitude of different shapes succeeding each other so fast that the eye is only able to take cognizance of them all at once. They do not occur all at once. It is only because we see these shapes in such rapid succession that they seem to us to exist all at one time. We have thus far spent our time considering the light of the candle, discussing how the fuel gets to the wick and the form of the flame upon combustion. But we have more questions to ponder. From where does the brightness come? And where does the candle eventually go? And in a larger sense, how do the products of combustion lead us to a discussion of the atmosphere? And what is the relationship between combustion and respiration? I started this lecture by claiming that there is no more open door by which to enter into the study of science than by considering the physical phenomenon of the candle. Over the next four lectures, I hope to prove this to you. We were occupied the last time we met in considering the general character and arrangement as regards the fluid portion of a candle and the way in which that fluid got into the place of combustion. And now I have to ask your attention to the means by which we are enabled to ascertain what happens in any particular part of the flame, why it happens, what it does in happening, and where, after all, the whole candle goes to. Because as you know very well, a candle being brought before us and burned disappears if burned properly without the least trace of dirt in the candlestick. And this is a very curious phenomenon. We will examine this dark part first. And now I take this bent glass tube and introduce one end into the middle of the flame. You see at once that something is coming from the flame. At the other end, you will see that something from the middle part of the flame is gradually drawn out and goes through the tube and into that flask, and there behaves very differently from what it does in the open air. It not only escapes from the end of the tube, but falls down to the bottom of the flask like a heavy substance, as indeed it is. We find that it is the wax of the candle made into a vaporous fluid, not a gas. You must learn the difference between a gas and a vapor. A gas remains permanent, a vapor is something that will condense. If you blow out a candle, you perceive a very nasty smell, resulting from the condensation of this vapor. This is very different from what you have outside the flame. And in order to make that more clear to you, I'm about to produce and set fire to a larger proportion of this vapor. For what we have in the small way in a candle, to understand thoroughly, we must as scientists produce in a larger way if needful that we may examine the different parts. Here is some wax on a glass flask, and I've made it hot as the inside of the candle flame is hot and the matter about the wick is hot. You see that the wax has become fluid and there's a little smoke coming from it and vapor rising up that I can set on fire. This then is exactly the same kind of vapor as we have in the middle of the candle. I have arranged another tube carefully in the flame and I was able, by a little care, to get that vapor to pass through the tube to the other extremity where I will light it and obtain absolutely the flame of the candle at a place distant from it. Now, look at that. Is not that a very pretty experiment? And you see from this that there are clearly two different kinds of action. One, the production of the vapor, and the other, the combustion of it, both of which take place in particular parts of the candle. I shall get no vapor from that part which is already burnt. If I raise the tube to the upper part of the flame, so soon as the vapor has been swept away, what comes away will be no longer combustible. It is already burned. How burned? 
might burn thus. In the middle of the flame, where the wick is, there is this combustible vapor. On the outside of the flame is the air which we shall find necessary for the burning of the candle. Between the two, intense chemical action takes place, whereby the air and the fuel act upon each other, and at the very same time that we obtain light, the vapor itself is consumed. If you examine where the heat of a candle is, you'll find it very curiously arranged. Suppose I take this candle, and hold a piece of paper close upon the flame, where is the heat of that flame? Do you not see that it is not in the inside? It is in a ring exactly in the place where I told you the chemical action was, and even in my irregular mode of making this experiment, if there is not too much disturbance, there will always be a ring because the heat is where the air and the fuel come together. This is most important for us as we proceed with our subject. Air is absolutely necessary for combustion, and what is more, I must have you understand that fresh air is necessary or else we should be imperfect in our reasoning and our experiments. Here is a jar of air. I place it over a candle, and it burns very nicely in it at first, showing that what I have said about it is true, but there will soon be a change. See how the flame is drawing upwards, presently fading, and at last going out. And going out why? The jar is full of air, partly changed, partly not changed, but it does not contain sufficient of the fresh air which is necessary for the combustion of a candle. These are all points which we, as young chemists, have to gather up. And if we look a little more closely into this kind of action, we shall soon find certain steps of reasoning extremely interesting. We have the case of the combustion of a candle, we have the case of a candle being put up by the one of air, and we now have the case of imperfect combustion. And this is to us so interesting that I want you to understand it as thoroughly as you do the case of a candle burning in its best possible manner. I will now make a great flame because we need the largest possible illustration. Here is a larger wick made from these cotton balls. All these things are the same as candles, after all. If we have larger wicks, we must have a larger supply of air, or we shall have less perfect combustion. Now, look at the black substance going up into the atmosphere. There's a regular stream of it. Look at the soot that flies off from the flame. See what an imperfect combustion it is, because it cannot get enough air. What then is happening? why certain things which are necessary to the combustion of a candle are absent and very bad results are accordingly produced. But we see what happens to a candle when it is burnt in a pure and proper state of air. Recall the charred ring on the paper. And on the other side, you see the burning of a candle produces the same kind of soot, charcoal, or carbon. Let me explain to you, as it is quite necessary for our purpose, that although I take a candle and give you as the general result its combustion in the form of a flame, we must see whether combustion is always in this condition or whether there are other conditions of flame. And we shall soon discover that there are and that they are most important to us. Here is a little gunpowder. You know that gunpowder burns with flame. We may fairly call it flame. It contains carbon and other materials which all together cause it to burn with a flame. And here is some pulverized iron or iron filings. Now, I propose burning these two things together, my object being to make the gunpowder set fire to the filings and burn them in the air, and thereby show the difference between substances burning with flame and not with flame. Now, here is the mixture, and when I set fire to it, you must watch the combustion, and you will see that it is of two kinds. You will see the gunpowder burning with a flame and the filings thrown up. You will see them burning too, but without the production of flame. They will each burn separately. There is the gunpowder which burns with a flame, and there are the filings. They burn with a different kind of combustion. You see then these two great distinctions, and upon these differences depend all the utility and all the beauty of flame which we use for the purpose of giving off light. When we use oil or gas or candle for the purpose of illumination, their fitness all depends on these different kinds of combustion. There are such curious conditions of flame that it requires some cleverness and nicety of discrimination to distinguish the kinds of combustion one from another. For instance, here is a powder which is very combustible, consisting, as you see, of separate little particles. It is called lycopodium, and each of these particles can produce a vapor and produce its own flame. But to see them burning, you would imagine it was all one flame. 
I will now set fire to a quantity and you will see the effect. We saw a cloud of flame, apparently in one body, but that rushing noise was proof that the combustion was not a continuous or a regular one. This is not an example of combustion like that of the filings I had been speaking of, to which we must now return. Suppose I take a candle and examine that part of it which appears brightest to our eyes. Why? There I get those black particles, which already you have seen many times evolve from the flame, and which I am now about to evolve in a different way. I have arranged the glass tube so as just to dip into this luminous part, as in our first experiment, only higher. You see the result. In place of having the same white vapor that we had before, we now have a black vapor. There it goes, as black as ink. It is certainly very different from the white vapor, and when we put a light to it, we shall find that it does not burn. Well, these particles, as I said before, are just the smoke of the candle. Why, it is the same carbon which exists in the candle. And how comes it out of the candle wax? It evidently existed in the wax, or else we should not have had it here. And now I want you to follow me in this explanation. You would hardly think that all those substances which flew around London in the form of soots and blacks are the very beauty and life of the flame, and which are burned as those iron filings were burned. I want you now to follow me in this point, that whenever a substance burns, as the iron filings burnt in the flame of gunpowder without assuming the vaporous state, whether it becomes liquid or remains solid, it becomes exceedingly luminous. What I have to say is applicable to all substances, whether they burned or whether they do not burn that they are exceedingly bright if they retain their solid form, and that it is to this presence of solid particles in the candle flame that it owes its brilliancy. I have here a piece of carbon or charcoal which will burn and give us light exactly in the same manner as if it were burnt as part of a candle. The heat that is in the flame of a candle decomposes the vapor of the wax and sets free the carbon particles. They rise up heated and glowing as this now glows and then enter into the air. But the particles when burnt never pass off from a candle in the form of carbon. They go off into the air as a perfectly invisible substance. I shall tell you about this later. Is it not beautiful to think that such a process is going on and that such a dirty thing as charcoal can become so incandescent? You see, it comes to this, that all bright flames contain these solid particles. All things that burn and produce solid particles, either during the time they are burning, as in the candle, or immediately after being burnt, as in the case of the gunpowder and iron filings, all these things give us this glorious and beautiful light. I've mixed potassium, chlorate, and sugar. I shall touch them with a drop of sulfuric acid for the purpose of giving you an illustration of chemical action, and they will instantly burn. Now, from the appearance of things, you can judge for yourselves whether they produce solid matter in burning. I've given you the train of reasoning which will enable you to say whether they do or do not. For what is this bright flame but the solid particles passing off? When the particles are not separated, you get no brightness. The flame of a candle owes its brightness to the separation during combustion of these particles of carbon. I can very quickly alter that arrangement. Here, for instance, is a bright yellow flame from propane at a Bunsen burner. Supposing I add so much air to the flame as to cause all to burn before those particles are set free, I shall not have this brightness. There is plenty of carbon in the gas, but because the atmosphere can get to it and mix with it before it burns, you see how pale and blue the flame is. The difference is solely due to the solid particles not being separated before the gas is burnt. You observe that there are certain products as the result of the combustion of a candle, and that of these products one portion may be considered as charcoal or soot. That charcoal, when afterwards burnt, produces some other product, and it concerns us very much now to ascertain what that other product is. This vessel captures all the products of the candle, and you will presently see the vessel's walls become quite opaque. The sides of the jar become cloudy, and the light begins to burn feebly. It is the products you see which make the light so dim, and this is the same thing which makes the sides of the vessel so opaque. If I take a spoon that's been in cold water, wipe it dry, and hold it over a candle so as not to soot it, you will find that it becomes dim just as the vessel's walls are dim.
And now, just to carry your thoughts forward to the time we shall next meet, let me tell you that it is water which causes the dimness. I will show you that we can make it without difficulty assume the form of a liquid. keeps the exterior of the candle cool. No fuel would serve for a candle which has not the property of giving this cup. These beautiful candles, which are irregular and intermittent in their shape, cannot have that nicely formed edge to the cup, which is the great beauty in a candle. I hope you will now see that the perfection of a process, that is its utility, is the better point of beauty about it. It is not the best looking thing, but the best acting thing, which is the most advantageous to us. These good looking candles are bad burning ones. There is guttering because of the irregularity of the stream of air and the badness of the cup which is formed thereby. You may see some pretty examples, and I trust you will notice these instances of the action of the ascending current when you have a little gutter running down the side of a candle, making it thicker there than it is elsewhere. As the candle goes on burning, that keeps its place and forms a little pillar sticking up by the side because as it rises above the rest of the fuel or wax, the air gets better around it and it is more cooled and better able to resist the action of the heat at a little distance. Now, the great mistakes and faults with regard to candles, as in many other things, often brings with them instruction which we should not receive if they had not occurred. We come here to be scientists, and I hope you will always remember that whenever a result happens, especially if it be new, you should say, what is the cause? Why does it occur? In choosing this for my subject, rather than any newer topic, which could not be better were it even so good. So, now as to the light of the candle. Notice that when the flame runs down the wick to the wax, it gets extinguished, but it goes on burning in the part above. Now, I have no doubt you will ask, how is it that the wax, which will not burn of itself, gets up to the top of the wick where it will burn? We shall presently examine that, but there is a much more wonderful thing about the burning of a candle than this. You have here a solid substance, the fuel, with no vessel to contain it, and how is it that this can get up to the place where the flame is? How is it that this solid gets there, it not being a fluid? Or when it's made of fluid, then how is it that it keeps together? I will tell you in five lectures the chemical history of a candle. There is not a law under which any part of the universe is governed which does not come into play and is touched upon in the chemistry of a candle. There is no better, there is no more open door by which you can enter into the study of science than by considering the physical phenomena of a candle. I trust, therefore, I shall not disappoint you. This is a wonderful thing about a candle. You see that a beautiful cup is formed. As the air comes to the candle, it moves upwards by the force of current which the heat of the candle produces. And it so cools all the sides of the wax as to keep the edge much cooler than the part within. The part within melts by the flame that runs down the wick as far as it can go before it's extinguished, but the part on the outside does not melt. The same force of gravity which holds worlds together holds this fluid in a horizontal position, and if the cup be not horizontal, of course the fluid will run away in guttering. You see, therefore, that the cup is formed by this beautifully, regularly ascending current of air playing upon all sides, which keeps